Okay. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Thank you uh, for your patience one more time. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, let's pray and we get started. Father, we uh, we love you. We thank you, um, Lord, for your faithfulness, uh, for your mercy and your strength. We thank you for this new day. Um, Jesus, we, we remember uh, everything that you've done for us. Lord. Uh, we bless you. We praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so we uh, started off this course on uh, introduction to youth ministry last week. Um, in the last in the last classes, we saw uh, the uh, who are the youth, uh, how the world defines uh, young people, and how they define or describe youth, and some of the labels that's attached uh, to in defining the young people. And uh, in the first chapter, we saw that uh, the youth are literally like the treasure of a nation. And um, and uh, in the context of India, India seems to be one of the youngest nation in, in, in the world. Uh, just to say that um, the average age and the, the, the population of young people are more in India than uh, any other country. It used to be number one. I will have to check the recent study on it. If India is still um, the youngest country, uh, but that's where it is. And uh, and the challenges arises uh, among other nations when there are no young people or the youth to uh, take over the leadership. And so that's another thing we saw, isn't it? The importance of youth and youth ministry in general is why is it important? Uh, most of you unanimously said that uh, you know they are the next generation leaders. Right, uh, so in a way that they are taking, uh, you know, we are the older generation is passing on the baton uh, to the to the younger generation, so to speak. Right, um, they are the future of a country. They are the future of the nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of that is what we saw. Uh, moving on to chapter two, we saw that uh, it's important to have a vision for youth ministry. It's important to have vision for life and for any ministry in general. Uh, but uh, it in context of youth ministry, we see that it is very important and crucial to have a vision of what you what we want to achieve, what we want to do, uh, where do we want to go? Because if you don't have a vision, it becomes very difficult to quantify uh, our goals, our progress. Right? Uh, if you don't have a goal, if you don't have a vision, how are you going to, um, you know? Uh, follow or your your progress or or keep a record or a track of your progress only if you've set a vision saying okay last year or last month we were here this month we've grown right in uh, and so and we're going to continue to grow and because you can track that progress simply because you have a goal you have a vision you know that you want to go from here to there and if you can't see this there uh, you you might be going up you might be coming down uh, but you will not have any way of quantifying the progress. So, and I think uh, vision uh, kind of helps us in keeping a track of uh, our growth, our progress, or uh, or even not the uh, not not the happy days, uh, if I may say. Okay, um, so that's what we learned in the last class, and in today's session, uh, we want to continue to uh, go in that spectrum of. Uh, uh, understanding our audience or identifying our audience, right? Because once again, if you remember, um, you know when I was uh, when I when I took over youth ministry at APC, I shared the five pillars, so to speak, um, that was very important, right? The, which is um, you get from the two verses, which from Matthew twenty-two and Matthew twenty-eight. The, the first two, the the first and the second one is I love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which can be translated as worship, and then love your neighbor as yourself, uh, which calls for ministry. And then moving into the Great Commission, uh, baptizing them, bringing, uh, teaching them to obey. Uh, you, you, you see there is evangelism, discipleship, and fellowship. Uh, now what we have to remember, or what I had to remember is it was very easy uh, for me to, uh, you know, go in a tangent and try to address all of those, uh, you know, uh, five purposes uh, in one program. 
it was very tempting. Okay, you know, we're going to have this youth meeting uh, every Sunday. We're going to have this combined youth meeting where all the five locations of APC youth are going to come. And we call it the pit stop. Uh, you know, what, what, what are we going to talk about? How do I decide on uh, which purposes do I need to teach on and work on? Because everything seems uh, very important. Right. But so it was very crucial for me to understand and realize at very soon, a very early stage that one program can't effectively fulfill all five purposes. One youth meeting uh, cannot. Uh, maybe you can speak, but I'm talking about the efficiency and the productivity or the effectiveness of what is being shared. Right. So in one program, if I speak about evangelism, worship, fellowship, discipleship uh, or ministry, uh, it I would have just shared a bunch of data. Or, or information. Uh, but without any much impact. So we have to come to a realization and learn that one program can't effectively fulfill all the five purposes. And that is why the next thing is we need to identify our target audience. Like, who are we trying to target with this program? Right? Who are we trying to target in this evening's youth ministry? Uh, what, uh, what do I want to impress on, on the young people's heart tonight or this morning? Um, you know, and so we have to make a decision. And in doing so, you are identifying okay, who this audience are, right? So we know that one program can't effectively target all the youth. Um, I hope we are in agreement with that. Simply because, uh, you know, I've just mentioned a few list of types of youth that might be, that might come to a youth meeting, right? There could be a non-Christian uh, in, in your audience. Right, who ha has uh, who who's just there because a friend bought them, you know, brought them along, invited them to this youth meeting, the first time to church. They are uh, non-Christian. They are an unbeliever. They are of a different faith or um, a different worldview, atheist, agnostic, etc. Um, and then there could be a new Christian who just given their life like a week ago or a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. They are a new Christian. They are still exploring uh, what they've decided to follow right uh, they've just given their uh, lives to jesus um, they don't know what water baptism is or the importance of that or the holy spirit baptism uh, and the gifts of the holy spirit etc etc uh, they are very new and then uh, you know uh, there are young people who are just forced to attend uh, the youth meeting by their parents uh, there might be young people who know a great deal uh, about the Bible. Uh, there's the growing student, there's the spiritual leader, and, and the list can go on. I, this is just some of the list, right? Uh, and now we can actually sit and make a, a very practical and a realistic list, and I, it, it will be a pretty long one and not just this five points. Right, so there's the non-Christian, there's the new Christian, uh, there's there are those who knows a great deal about the Bible, um, and uh, they are and then there's the growing student. There's a spiritual leader who is very mature in spiritual, uh, in their spirituality, in their walk with God, uh, and they serve as uh, they serve in the core team of the youth ministry. Right. So there are all these different people, audiences that you will be coming across. Who are you going to serve? Right, and uh, that's why it's uh, like super crucial for us to target our audience and uh, and identify them, so that you can effectively design or plan a program for them. Right. Um, so, uh, are are you all with me? Uh, are you guys doing okay? All right. Okay, uh, so let's just discuss about this a little bit. Uh, but before I could, uh, you know, go any further, uh, do you mind sharing uh, what is your view and your perspective and the importance of identifying your audience?
yeah anyone uh, feel free to uh, you know just share your view it's uh, there there's no right or wrong answer um, share your view on the importance of uh, identifying your audience and why is it important how is uh, and if you have tried to do that in your walk uh, as a leader or in ministry or in life how has that helped you if any practical examples that you want to share Pastor, the reason why identifying one is audience is very important. It has got a number of factors, but let me mention a few according to my own medula obringata. Number one is it will determine your curriculum. Once you realize who you're going to talk to, it will tentatively determine what you're going to talk to. It's not that it, it will determine the curriculum, it will determine the scope, because mm -hmm. if they are if they are new converts, it's true that the curriculum will always be the Christ, but the scope will usually vary depending on their maturity into the Christ. Number yeah. two can be the methodology. Methodology will change, will vary according to your goals and objectives of, uh, of the trainings or the, the kind of people who are taking up your meal. <laughs> At times, my mom would say that once you know your visitors, you will always determine how you're going to cook the menu, the, whatever you're going to add in. Can I pause from there for a minute? Uh, right. Yeah, Colin, thank you, Colin. So that, that is uh, ab ab spot on. Uh, it's very simple to understand. And, you know, um, and if, as you mentioned, if you know who you're hosting, uh, you know what to cook for. Yeah, right uh, that is a very simple way of identifying and the importance of knowing your audience right it it will have an impact on your curriculum or your content um and the scope of improving uh, as you mentioned and also your methods and how you want to deliver that content um right fantastic okay um what else guys uh, i see divya said that we need to identify the audience of the group so that we can address those specific needs yeah absolutely yes You know, uh, uh, while some of you are thinking about sharing, um, I recently, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of uh, I've heard a lot of revival stories, and Jesus Movement is one of those revival stories that I've heard a lot uh, in the in the late seventies, in the late sixties, and the early seventies. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure if you've heard of the Jesus Movement or the Jesus Revolution that happened that began in California in a church called Calvary Chapel by Chuck Smith, pastor. Um, it, and I've heard people, a lot of people talk about it. And uh, and why am I sharing this? Is because recently, uh, okay, so this is movie released on Netflix called Jesus Revolution. And uh, I, I, I was I was watching that, and I saw how uh, you know it was originally it was it was among this jesus movement or this revolution or this revival was among the drug addicts be getting saved right and they were known as the hippies from the california uh state uh, from the west coast basically and uh and how a lot of the churches were very hesitant to uh, bring them in into their church because uh one they identify the audience uh, but they were very scared of their audience like okay how do we let them in because they dress a certain way they speak a certain way their language is very different the, their style uh, of music is so different uh and uh and then eventually they it, it took up a, a, a man of god to kind of take that step of faith and risk and allow them uh, in and and everything changes after that, right? In the way that uh, the content will remain the same in terms that gospel is the gospel, uh, but the methods in the way that they began to preach the gospel and the good news to uh, these drug addicts, to those who are searching for truth, uh, changed drastically. And so I think that was very inspiring. Um, yeah, um, sorry, I jumped in. Uh, anybody else wants to share uh, your, your thoughts on uh, identifying the audience, your own personal experience? Uh, 
other more pastor yes just just to to jump in furthermore i think it will also determine the time frame for instance if uh, if i'm the uh youth who are in, in between 15 to 20 or between 18 to 20 the time frame i will need to cover that content depending on their maturity in christ might vary with others who are in their late age that is 23 maybe to 25. Right. Thing, so time will vary depending on my on my curriculum so a curriculum all the goals and visions of my training all my teaching all my curriculum is very important thank you yeah thank you collins yeah the time frame yeah good okay uh anybody else yes Divya, go ahead yeah, yeah, Pastor. I think uh, the children's ministry, uh, what whatever we were learning was uh, dependent on the age groups uh, mm -hmm. because we were learning about different learning styles. We we're learning about uh, different age groups and their specific needs. Um, and so how uh, we could cater to those uh, specific learning styles and right specific needs so i i feel it's the same uh in the case of youth as right. well uh especially with children their attention span is small so uh, how how the the methodology we use to um uh, you know uh, describe the concepts may differ as per the age groups that's why uh, we would have different age groups categorized into different classes and such things right. so okay even among youth uh, it may not be the gradient may not be that visible but of course uh, there should be a classification made based on their learning styles their needs uh, the stages of life that they are in and such things yeah yeah yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for elaborating uh, on that. So, uh, um, okay, so we have Colin to share another one. It says, okay, uh, mode of assessment and evaluation of content learned is also a factor in play. A historical back group of my group is also important. Yeah, historical back group of uh, your group is also important. Correct. Um, so, you know, age is not always necessarily the factor that we, that we have to take into consideration uh, it is important that we take age into uh, as a factor into consideration uh, but let's say for example uh, on the point that collins has mentioned a historical back group of a group or a, a historical seems like a slightly uh, heavy word let's just say the background for so, and say the age group remains the same uh, for example um, the youth in uh, say an APC, for example, between 8 and 21, um, versus the same age uh, a, a group of people in a, uh, like a Methodist church or a more traditional church or, or uh, I've heard young people from another traditional denomination like a CSI or a, um, Lutherans and whatnot. Like we've ministered in, you know, both the places, but you you can see that how young people are kind of reserved in um, uh, in a more traditional setting, same age group, uh, but the way they uh, present or engage is more very is very different than how a, a young people from a young person from a, a slightly more charismatic or if I should say charismatic still seems like a very strong word charismatic or a slightly radical um, you know church would respond to the content etc right and i think yeah I, we've, we've established uh, the point uh, enough to say that uh, understanding or identifying your audience um, is uh, extremely crucial right because it's safe to assume that um, as a youth pastor that your target audience uh, could be teenagers or uh, young adults or youth like you know between 21 and 25 uh, but what if that was wrong right so, yeah as a youth pastor you should reach uh, you know the teenagers the youth and the young adults but sometimes uh, we need to be a little bit more specific right because um, while the teenagers in your community are similar to the ones in uh, in your i'm talking about your community right 
uh, you say let's say you are the youth pastor like jeffina is the youth pastor you know whoever um so they could be very similar but then they will still have distinct uh, differences right so if you don't know uh, your target audience um, these are these are my experiences okay if you don't know your target audience uh, one you will have high turnover but uh, there will be lack of engagement and ineffective ministry these are just uh, my observations okay you know, if you don't know your target audience uh, you there are chances that you will have high turnover uh, but uh, eventually because lack of engagement uh, in there will be uh, the ministry in itself will be very ineffective because uh, teenagers won't feel connected because they don't know you you don't know them i'm talking about the uh, the consequences of not knowing your audience okay uh, simply because they will struggle to find uh, the relevancy um, behind what you are sharing with them right uh, one of the most important things what a young people wants to feel or how they want to feel is that they want to feel belonged um, right if they don't get what you're saying they will switch off uh, right and uh, you know pastor ashish shared this recently is there's a major de church that is happening in the north american continent uh, and i believe is because in um, the what the study says that then in the in the huge percentage of them are not able to connect with what's being uh, shared so knowing your uh, target audience so knowing your target audience will help you create uh, programs that will help you reach your vision for the next generation and you see how it comes back to the vision right if you know your target audience it will help you um, create a program event plan in you, it helps you become very intentional so that you can reach your vision for the next generation okay uh, and in another way uh, how you can get to know your target audience is what uh, what I've observed is where they spend their uh, time and where they spend their money on yeah, it's it, it sounds a little creepy but it's not it's really not okay <laughs> uh, so when you look at where uh, your youth uh, spend most of their time and most of their money uh, you will see what they value right time and money are kind of precious and something that they value right so uh, when you know what they value right, it will enable you to see what owns their heart you're trying to identify your audience it goes much more deeper than okay he's a christian she's not a christian he's new believer he's not a new believer it's, it's uh, identifying your target audience goes beyond that from the surface level it kind of begins there but you go deeper to know them right um to to really know what they're after what uh, what's happening in their life uh, you are taking time to understand them right uh, so where they spend their time uh, their money um, I mean in the recent times it is not very difficult for us to know that uh, you know the huge percentage of the time is on social media um, you know not there and you know other things as well but social media to the huge uh, point uh, time spent on editing reels uh, yeah it's uh, <laughs> I have, uh, yeah, okay, let's not go there. But uh, I'm spent uh, the money. I mean, because I interacted a lot with the boys, um, they are, from what I've learned, they are huge into this thing called, uh, you know, sneakers. Uh, not, not the chocolate sneakers. It's, uh, it's the shoes. And uh, have you heard of them, right? Or am I the only one? Uh, and. <laughs> and i i didn't know how expensive they were they are uh, they are very expensive like, okay they're like ridiculously expensive okay and not just expensive they're like I'm like boys what are you all doing <laughs> right but it, it gives me an idea of uh, you know what they are after like where they spend their time their money and also uh, it doesn't stop there with uh, in getting to know them but it's also very important kind of from the kind of a family uh, what makes up their family as well it's very important um, because uh, i mean are they coming from a broken family uh, are they coming from uh, you know like a single parent house or uh, 
uh, etc etc right i'm just getting to know their family because now you're not just engaging with them but you are also engaging with their parents and i and i believe that uh, be it in children's ministry goes without saying but then you know teens slash uh, youth ministry uh, it, your relationship should really not stop uh, with the youth uh, if it is possible for you to engage with the parents uh, or the parent of the youth uh, it's it, it will be very helpful for the growth of your um, ministry right and so all of that said, um, and I'm, I hope you're still alive and you're following, uh, you know, what's going on. All of that, it boils down to this point, saying to their relationship with the church. All of this, uh, um, you know, effort and time that you are taking as a pastor or as a leader to know your audience is simply to understand their relationship or the relationship they have with the church, if they have a relationship at all with the church. Right? Because the youth uh, in your community uh, have a relationship with the church. What kind of relationship? Is it good, strong, weak? Uh, is what we're going to learn, OK? Because uh, it just might not be uh, you know, the church or your church. Um, it, it might not be a strong one. to. Uh, to, so to know the relationship, you need to look at uh, you know, like the other churches as well. And so if you look at the PDF that I've shared, um, this is like a general, um, you know, like a concentric circles or where people have uh, described or, or have tried to define where a certain committed audience are uh, in you know in this circle so at the very core at the center uh, you have people who are you know, who are core to a movement uh, to a leadership team or to a ministry right and then there are those who are committed and then there are you know as the circle goes up, gets bigger and bigger the commitment of the audience of the people in that uh, you know circle gets less okay so as the audience, uh, you know, keep getting out and out and out, uh, the, their commitment levels are decreased. Okay, um, so this is the generic, uh, like a diagram of, uh, you know, how audience are perceived. But it was a little different uh, at APC, right? And so I have taken the liberty to kind of redefine. Uh, for our own understanding. Um, so this is in the context of APC in the next page you would see. And so um, again, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, make this your own. Uh, it doesn't, everything that you're learning here doesn't have to be applied directly because like I said, it would be the same age group and whatnot, but then uh, the culture would be different. Um, the context will be different. And so take that and make it your own. So at APC, uh, the crowd and congregation people are who are they you know uh, how my way of identifying them are uh, in the outer circle they attend the church okay they may or may not have given their lives to Jesus okay so they attend church um, one because they'd be forced by their parents or their friends brought them um, whatever could be the reason but they are in the outer circle, outer courts, right? In the outer courts of the outer courts. Um, and they are, they could be shy and introvert. Um, so because of which what happens is they don't engage with anybody else in the church. They're very quiet. Um, they sit in, they sit in the same spot every Sunday uh, because it's the closest to the exit. Uh, and so even before pastor has begun the benediction, uh, escape. Right, they're out <laughs> before you know it, they're gone. All right, so the, uh, these are the kind of people who I would put into the category of a crowd and congregation. And and then there are those uh, who are uh, would categorize as part of the community is they attend church, uh, they are committed to growing spiritually. That means they are they are plugged into a small group or a or a life group. 
know, or a cell group, as we can call it, um, they volunteer in uh, different ministries, right? They, um, they, they come and help in different areas of the church, but they are not necessarily proactive, right? But they are definitely interested in growing. These are all the kind of people you will come across, right? Uh, they attend the church. Uh, they are committed to growing spiritually. Uh, you know, they want to be part of the cell group. Uh, they want to be discipled. They want to serve, etc. Uh, but they are not necessarily proactive. What is proactive? Uh, what's the opposite of proactive? Reactive. Okay. They are okay. If you tell them what to do, they will do it. Uh, it's, it doesn't. It, it not necessarily always occurs to them saying, "Okay, you know, there's a need there. Okay, this is what needs to be done. That's what needs to be done. This is what has to be done, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. No, but um, they are not necessarily proactive, uh, but they are very much available and they are very much interested in growing. And so, it, as a pastor, as a leader, it is very important for you to identify these kind of uh, people as well. And then there's the core. Right, they attend the church. They are like you know, you know, full on. They're proactive. They are committed to doing ministry, uh, with whatever it is. Uh, you know, they are willing to serve ten times a week, wherever you want to send them. Uh, they are willing to go, uh, no questions asked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then there are these kinds of people. So you notice that each group size will decrease as commitment increases. The size of each group, as it decreases, the commitment increases. So as you become part of the core team, that means there's more responsibility. There's more commitment. And as you know, as, as a, a circle or a group becomes bigger, the commitment decreases. Right? What commitment does a member in the crowd or the congregation have? They don't really have any commitment except for them to come to church and that they're committed to the church. That's it. Uh, besides that, um, you know, they are not committed to a life group or a cell group. They are not committed to any volunteering group, uh, teams, etc. Um, they don't want to spiritually grow. They don't have any major commitments, and so less stress, <laughs> right? So the circle of commitment reminds us of our potential audience. Right? The circles of commitment it reminds us of our potential. Audience. So our goal as a leader is to you are constantly thinking, okay, you know, uh, you know, Zelatoli and and Divya and Linden, they are part of this crowd circle. They are in the outer courts. Uh, as a leader, what can I do? What program can I plan that can bring them in slowly, right? Uh, how and so that's the goal is how can you bring the members out there. Uh, you know, who just want to come and go to the core. And not everybody necessarily uh, have to be part of the core team. That's not what I mean by that. But they feel belong, that they are very proactive, that they are spiritually growing, and they want to take other young people uh, under their wings to walk with them and disciple with them under your leadership, etc., etc. Okay, and I have had it some more. Uh, added some more points in how we can uh, help and uh, you know make this happen so you can take this and uh, apply that or imply that uh, in your journey as a pastor or as a leader okay um, so that's just simple um, topic on chapter three identifying your audience the importance of it what happens when you don't have uh, when you don't identify your audience is that your the, the numbers will be there, uh, but uh, there will be lack of engagement and ineffective ministry. Um, there won't be much progress or growth. Okay, uh, any thoughts, guys? Did this make sense? Sure, it does. <laughs> Okay, all right, thanks, Collins. Great, okay, um, so what we'll do, uh, we'll pause here, uh, we'll come back after the break and we'll um, resume to the next uh, chapter. Okay, thank you.